So, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Um, yes, we are slightly behind the schedule. Uh, I mean, to, to paraphrase what, what, what I said before the, the coffee break is that indeed, more we drink coffee, less we have time to speak. Just take <laughs> this in, in, into account. But. Um, uh, I, I would like now to, to, to, to, to announce uh, our second session, and this session is on resilient media, ensuring the right of citizens to balanced, factual and reliable information. In a way, it was already, uh, we had kind of the lead-in session, the previous one. Uh, you see that you can, if you speak about the, the media environment, in, in, um, in the countries of Eastern Partnership, inevitably you are coming uh, to this particular topic. And, and here I, I, I would like now to, to pass um, uh, the helm of, of, of, of the forthcoming discussion to Roland Fronenstein, who is the Deputy Director of uh, Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies and uh, I, I, I must say, a, a, a very distinguished um, um, researcher in, in, in, in issues related to, to the uh, functioning of, of, of the state foreign policy and also uh, issues related uh, to, to, to the new democratic institutions. So, Roland, please, shoot. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll try. Sorry, I'll try my best. Uh, well, not necessarily to shoot, but uh, to discuss. That's what we're here for. Um, I believe the, the second panel will be very much, uh, as, as the minister just said, uh, will be very much a continuation of the first. There will not be a clear separation of topics. We are still, uh, we continue to talk about the resilience of media vis-a-vis -vis different threats and challenges. One of those is obviously uh, Russian propaganda, Russian influence. Another one is uh, maybe in some of the Eastern Partnership countries authoritarian governments. And uh, another one again is uh, the question of ownership. Uh, the oligarchs is, is, a, is a term that uh, we can mention in this context. So there is a multitude of challenges and threats to independent media, and uh, we should discuss how those media can be made more resilient. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists at this point in time. Uh, I'll start with uh, Minister Datze Melbarde, right here in the middle, who's the Minister for Culture of the Republic of Latvia. Um, she will speak in Latvian in the initial statement. So we'll have, actually, we'll have a trilingual panel now, um, Latvian, English, and Russian. Um, uh, she has worked before as the Secretary General of the Latvian National Commission for UNESCO um, uh, and has a, a rich and impressive career in um, Latvian uh, government. Uh, she's also been the country manager of the British Council in Latvia and I think is the best uh, possible um, speaker to introduce this panel. Now we'll continue with Mr. Petru Makove to my right here, uh, who is the executive director of the Association of Independent Press in Moldova. Um, he has over 20 years career as a journalist, mainly on radio and television. Um, he's also worked as a trainer at the Chisinau Advanced School of Journalism. So I think, uh, need I say more uh, about his qualification to discuss the issues at hand. Next, we have Jeanne Litvina, uh, who is the chairwoman of the Belarusian Association of Journalists. Um, uh, it, it, uh, and she has um, also um, worked in journalism itself. She was uh, for several years, uh, she, she founded and then ran for several years Radio Razia, which is one of the independent uh, media, very active. Um, 
in Belarus. And when I was the director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Warsaw in the late 90s, actually, I was uh, very happy to cooperate with Radio Razia in those years. She's also received several awards, such as the Golden Pen of Freedom Prize, the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Speech, and the Atlantic Council Freedom Award. Now, last but by no means least, Jerzy Pomianowski, on the extreme right, at least geographically speaking, um, the executive director of the European Endowment for Democracy, a uh, rich career in um, public service in Poland, uh, two years as Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, he is now, since January 2013, the, uh, the Executive Director of this institution. And I think those who've been yesterday at the presentation of the preliminary findings of the report of the EED uh, on, on uh, uh, uh, new ways to, to counter uh, Russian propaganda, I think, know that he is doing an extremely important job. Uh, he has also been the ambassador to Japan of Poland, uh, which is probably uh, one of the reasons why he is now the president of the Polish Aikido Federation. Now, Aikido, literally translated, is the way of harmonious spirit, but don't be deceived, it's a martial art. It is to disable your opponent while doing minimum harm to him, uh, very humane, but uh, it's, I think, it's a very important quality for the job he's doing. Uh, he was also an active member of democratic students' opposition in Poland in the 1980s. So, without further ado, I'd like to ask the first question to the minister, Ratze Melbarde, and ask her, what is your take on how to increase the resilience of media in face of the numerous threats, especially the Russian one in these days. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to say some words in English and, and afterwards to switch to, to my native language, the Latvian, to let you hear the, how the Latvian language sounds and how, how, how rich it is. But in, uh, in the introduction part, I'd like also to inform you that uh, yesterday I had the uh, privilege to uh, chair a council meeting of uh, ministers for culture and audiovisual sector, and the major polis political debate we, we will had uh, was on the future of the audiovisual, uh, uh, audiovisual media uh, environment. And I hope uh, I will also be able to share ideas and su uh, suggestions expressed uh, by ministers during this meeting. But now, with your permission, I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to, to talk in, in, in Latvian, and if you need to prepare your devices, then you are very welcome to, to do it. Um, Dear guest, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the topic that you, uh, that you have chosen which in uh, Latvian language is uh, translated quite in a quite a sophisticated way, which is media security. And the first thing that I have in my mind when I think about media, media security is uh, the society's trust uh, to the media, because uh, media will be strong until uh, me media only will be strong when uh, people believe, believe them. And of course, uh, the questions of media resilience is now actual for every one of us in connection of the increasing propaganda from uh, Europe and also from our neighboring country. So it is not enough to only speak about media quality. It is very important to speak about how we work with our society and with its trust to media that cannot be lost. And this is why one of our major ways that we have to think about, and especially that what we can learn from Ukraine's experience, is the possibility, is, is uh, the skills of our society to recognize propaganda and how we can attain it. I think that we have to ensure uh, space for critical discourse in our uh, social uh, uh, in our society, and this is why we have to. 
uh, teach people to understand media and the factors that influence them. And it is important that we do it not only in school and in official curriculum, but it is very important to integrate uh, these uh, media literacy questions in different, uh, in different initiatives and uh, vol voluntary projects. And I think that only in uh, this cooperation, with the cooperation of, with journalists and NGOs, we will be able to develop in our society this critical way of thinking. Another way how we can promote uh, promote our fight against uh, informative informational aggression, aggression is to work uh, to deconstruct uh, the propaganda. And here we have two possible ways. Uh, the first of them would be first of all to support analytical journalism and also it is necessary to support different social platforms that uh, uh, involve our society and uh, disclose manipulations with the reality. And here I would like to mention Ukraine's top fake platform. And I know that we have a representative of this platform here in our hall. And I think he or she could share uh, the interesting experience in this topic. And we think that this is the best way to prove how our society can uh, be involved in the process of forming, uh, of forming reliable media. At the same time, as a politician, I would like to highlight uh, that uh, development of reliable journalism cannot be connected to any kind of propaganda. And the point that we have to think about when we're developing our national media policy and searching for international support tools for our media, we have to think about how to support plural, multi pluralism and how to support media work. And in such a way, we can ensure uh, journalism based on democratic values. And also concerning uh, media sustainability, I would like to mention an important factor which is the owners, the ownership. We have to uh, settle mechanisms that would allow us to find uh, the true beneficiary of each enterprise and uh, to make all the structure transparent and another question that we have to solve in order to ensure the trust for media is to ensure um, is to solve the question about uh, media monopolies. So it is very important to create a mechanism that would prevent uh, monopolization of media in the hands of one single owner. And finally, I would like to highlight that it is crucial. To, for media, it is crucial to regulate the action themselves. Our internet era ha has increased professional ethics and standards. And nowadays, uh, media themselves discuss the standards and ethical questions because their aim is to achieve greater trust And in conclusion, as a very important uh, question for media resilience, I would like to mention the necessity to increase international cooperation for creation of democratic and pluralistic media environment. And uh, we already had many workshops that proposed interesting solutions, as, for example, to create a special fund and the frame of uh, European Union that could support journalism. And uh, as uh, yesterday I understood, uh, our experts have presented their vision how we can uh, develop uh, qu high quality journalism and pluralism. Thank you. Minister. Um, 
So this was an excellent overview of the, the different aspects of increasing resilience of media, what governments can do, what, what points they should um, take into account. But Petru Makove, well, can you, from, from your situation in Moldova, which is, which is quite different from, uh, uh, from that of, of, of Latvia or of Ukraine or of Belarus, um, could you tell us what your take on this question of media resilience is? What are the main challenges? What would be the solutions in the case of Moldova? Thank you very much. Uh, for being more understandable, I, I will speak in Russian. Thank you. Uh, of course, the situation in Moldova, uh, which I will directly show to you to show you how uh, the resilience of media is influenced by political processes in our country and the interests of oligarchs and politicians that are owners of, of many media, uh, media outlets. But I would like to first speak about the general tendency. Uh, in my opinion, at the moment, all over the world, the journalism uh, uh, globally, but also in new democracies, and especially in the countries of European partnership, is going through the most difficult uh, moment of its uh, activity since its inception, because the challenges are multiple. And of course, propaganda, Russian propaganda specifically, is a great challenge, but there is another challenge as significant, which is the local propaganda, local uh, manipulation of public opinion through media, and also the fact that uh, such small countries as Moldova, for example, media on the media market in the, in the last years there is a great concentration of media which influences the pluralism of opinion which uh, are presented to the citizens and of course all these challenges taken together in my opinion make uh, journalism in our countries especially to face uh, great challenges and it influences their resilience um, resilience of media as a platform through which the right of citizens for objective information is being fulfilled. And if we speak about the right of citizens for objective information, I, uh, the first challenge, and here I agree with previous speakers, is of course that the, the resilience of media in our countries is directly influenced by the fact that we are in the zone of direct influence of Russian media. And in most countries of Eastern par Partnership, uh, uh, Russian media are rebroadcasted re and the con their content is often on local platforms, which means local companies that are own owned by local owners, they rebroadcast or some they are uh, par parasitic on the um, Russian brands. And when we speak about the citizens' rights for objective information, it's very important and I believe it is not just the task of the journalism, but first of all of professional journalism and the task of also of the whole uh, society and even of governments of uh, democratic countries which do not want to use their media as just propaganda, but understand that people have the right for objective information through media. So our common task is to explain to people, to, uh, to uh, enlighten people through media literacy, to devel develop critical mind of the public. Because, for example, a survey of public opinion in um, the Republic of Moldova shows that more than a half of our citizens trust uh, Moldova media in general. The majority of them, uh, as we've heard, trust the uh, Russian media. At the same time, the same surveys show that uh, people understand the fact that the most of media are controlled by political uh, forces or groups or oligarchs. So this is, uh, uh, these are um, contradictory conclusions people know that media are being controlled but still they trust them why does it happen 
it? I think it happens because uh, citizens of our countries uh, are not used to uh, um, watch critically what they are shown every evening or what they read in newspapers or in the internet or here uh, on the radio. They got used to it and uh, to some extent they are even happy that someone made this decision uh, instead of them, what they should see. And they agree and they give their consent and the results of the um, most recent uh, elections in uh, Moldova, uh, parliamentary elections and uh, the elections of Bashkan, which is a governor in the south of Moldova, uh, showed how affected people are by these messages uh, they receive through media. I wanted to uh, mention some uh, aspects that have already been discussed, but I think we need to uh, pay uh, specific attention to these issues, because the situation over the last years showed us how um, difficult the situation is at the moment. Uh, my colleagues may correct me, but in Ukraine the Ministry of uh, Education uh, has already approved uh, optional classes on media literacy and we hope that in our country the Ministry of uh, Education will uh, um, adopt uh, the uh, media literacy classes in the nearest future and I hope that these classes will not be uh, optional, they will be uh, mandatory because this is something we must do at the governmental level and um, we also must pay attention to the protection of our informational market. The Russian Federation approved the strategy of development of the, uh, their informational um, space uh, in 2007 and it was uh, modified and so complemented in 2009. What is done in Moldova? Nothing. Uh, at the beginning of this conference, uh, we've heard about uh, an attempt to adopt a law in Moldova, mm, which uh, uh, would declare the willingness to uh, fight uh, propaganda. Uh, but um, this would mean uh, the uh, measures allowing uh, in unloyal competition in the market and we need to discuss unloyal competition separately because in such small countries and such small markets such as Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan the most important players are always the one that have a lobby in uh, politics and uh, they will try to use non-competitive methods to exclude alternative players from the market. In this situation uh, that is currently observed in the Republic of Moldova there are a lot of TV channels including national broadcast uh, channels controlled by politicians or oligarchs. In our opinion this problem uh, can not be solved because uh, at the end uh, politicians will make decisions and they are not interested in the uh, possibility to create um, loyal competition in the market which would be beneficial not only for pluralism but also for development of local content local product I think the situation is very similar in other countries of uh, Eastern Partnership the European partnership. So we would like the European Union to um, uh, exercise pressure on, on our national governments uh, in order to decrease the uh, media concentration um, under the law and to guarantee loyal competition in our media market. We all talk about uh, sustainability, media sustainability during this conference, but this sustainability, as some colleagues said, is impossible in the market con under the market conditions without any dotations or funding, without um, some efforts from the part of governments that must be interested in providing uh, populistic uh, ideas to uh, people and uh, 
having uh, several channels. Therefore, we believe that the government and the European Union must help us. The European Union must uh, exercise pressure on the government and make them take measures aimed at supporting the local um, companies local producers, local broadcasters, local editors, because in our markets mm, uh, there are magazines from uh, Russian Federation that uh, mm, get the most of the advertisement. At the end I would like to uh, mention uh, another aspect. Today we've uh, already discussed a new trend, social media, and the fact that uh, traditional media must expand to have more possibilities uh, to develop professional journalism. Of course it is necessary, but under conditions uh, when in some countries governments do not understand the importance of such measures. I think it will, under these conditions, it will be very hard to, uh, to do and to implement. Someone told me that the um, government of Moldova hires thralls, of course unofficially, so that uh, uh, these people would, uh, so to say, thrall some information online. And uh, this made me think that uh, the uh, governmental officials uh, think uh, in the same way in other countries. And some peop many people believe that uh, uh, propaganda can be fought with uh, um, anti-propaganda, um, which I do not agree with. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I, I think we, we have already two very important key words here for what the European Union should do. Um, one is pressure on governments, the other one is funding and um, other kinds of support. But before we go into more detail of EU policies, uh, let me now turn to Rana Litvina and ask her um, what about well, what uh, our previous speaker, Petru Makovey, called local manipulation, I think uh, that in, in the case of Belarus, that would even be an understanding, an understatement. Um, uh, it's, uh, we, we are talking about a situation in which the government is very much in control of more or less everything that happens in the country, and um, in which, um, uh, you know, civil society in Belarus itself, and of course its supporters in, uh, in the European Union, in the West in general, will have to find maybe different answers to, uh, uh, to, to the challenges to uh, media resilience. Uh, Jana, the floor is yours. I understand you will be speaking in Russian too. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm going to speak Russian. Uh, I think the characteristic uh, feature of uh, Belarus uh, in among the countries of the Eastern Partnership is the fact that over the last 20 years uh, Belarus did not witness these uh, processes of demopolization and uh, getting rid of uh, governmental influence. So we are stuck in this Soviet uh, mentality with one leg, but this is the reason why journalists and the media need changes in Belarus. Uh, we, well, from the Soviet times we uh, have the same attitude um, from the government uh, towards journalists as partners, as uh, supporters of uh, national ideology when we uh, talk about the necessity of uh, monopolization and we can hear the words of the leader of our state is that uh, ideology cannot be privatized. The most dominating uh, are uh, state, national uh, state-funded uh, media. They are funded from the uh, budget of the Republic. They have uh, uh, subscriptions uh, in various institutions and they have a number of preferences. So these are the most uh, vital media. However, uh, the uh, latest uh, events uh, showed during uh, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict uh, that uh, this control, the 
because state regulation weakens media. Uh, they uh, are uh, free of the responsibility in force majeure um, situations. They are waiting for instructions and for the first week after uh, the uh, events in Ukraine started, our media were almost silent because uh, national uh, uh, attitude of the uh, government uh, hasn't been formulated. Therefore, uh, the information was uh, not spoken out loudly and uh, mm, there were no information about uh, things that are happening in a neighboring country. Uh, unfortunately, our Belar Belarusian media were unable to formulate the Belarusian position mm, uh, in respect of the events uh, occurring in the neighboring state. We can give a lot of uh, examples of such manipulation of information inside the country. Uh, when the uh, gist of the information is hidden and Belarus may be the country which is uh, most uh, vulnerable to propaganda uh, influence from Russia because when our minister uh, talks about the uh, openness of informational space Mm, saying that our informational uh, space is w wide open towards Russia and the propaganda we are facing um, is very fruitful and two-thirds of uh, Belarus uh, citizens trust in Russian media. As a result, we can see uh, disinformation of people and we can see the rise of imperial mentality. And last year, 62% of uh, Belarusians accepted uh, Crimea annexion and, uh, as a historical, um, historically just uh, and right uh, event. Uh, Belarus uh, media are um, able to uh, cope with this propaganda and the, uh, one of the ways is to develop the informational uh, space um, for independent, uncontrolled uh, me in all our countries and in Belarus first of all. Uh, the situation is also deteriorated by another fact and I must mention it here. In case of aggression of uh, Russian propaganda, our government made the legislation stricter and uh, these amendments are aimed at increasing control. Now I'm talking about amendments to the law on media adopted in December last year. They were adopted in a very short time on the fourth day after it was read in the parliament. Four days later it was signed by the president and then it was uh, adopted and came into effect. So our internet resources are considered as media with all uh, subsequent consequences. So all the legislation related to media also uh, affects the internet resources. The Ministry of Information took upon itself or the amendments confirmed its authority to block Internet resources if they place information in contradiction to state and public interest. The testing of blocking the resources we have already experienced. Several days ago, the Ministry of Information started to send out mails to specific resources with warnings that after two warnings or more for this or that contradictive information the resources will be blocked. One of the resources is uh, Ratsia.com which has been registered in Poland and acts according to Polish uh, legislation, has also received such a letter and experts started to speak at once about the violation of international agreements by Belarus. First of all, the International Pact about Political Citizenship Rights, Article 19, which stipulates freedom of the spread of information 
despite geographical borders. The hardening of this pressure on journalists who work as accredited journalists is also one of the most painful uh, issues. Uh, the work without accreditation uh, is forbidden in Belarus, and registration of journalists that work for foreign media is conducted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then it's already a vicious circle. When journalists uh, ap uh, apply for accreditation, they receive the um, refusal based on the fact that they had been working without accreditation. So this is an artificial uh, problem created. So they uh, follow journalists that work without accreditation on foreign resources and then they prosecute them and find them. And uh, from the beginning of this year, 12 journalists have been fined uh, f for the total amount of more than $5,000 for Belarus, for Belarusian journalists. Even if he or she cooperates with the foreign media, it's a very, very painful amount. Uh, and the most vulnerable colleagues are journalists that work uh, in satellite channel Belsat that broadcasts from Poland and the journalists of Red Radio Razia are outlaws in our country. Our organization pushes through uh, the uh, another for another principle of accreditation in our country. We have very many problems with access to information on work of state structures. It's a very big and complex topic, uh, and I will not go into details here, but I would like to return to uh, yesterday's report uh, by Natalia Lichachova during the presentation of the uh, preliminary results of the research. And I liked her presentation very much, but I still want to pay attention to the need to adopt the approach uh, in every country, taking into consideration the specificities of every country during the implementation of all those recommendations um, of the research. I understand that I have uh, extended my time, but I still want to say that the journalistic community in Belarus uh, wants to uphold standards. That, uh, that is our main task. And I believe that International Federation of Journalists, European Federation of Journalists, have to elaborate their strategy to delimit themselves from informational fighters and informational wars, from propagandists which also claim to be representatives of our profession. Today, independent media, professional media, have to become an institute of good name, good reputation, which base themselves of, on the factuality of information. We have to hold on to our profession and delimit it from those other representatives. And I would like to thank personally Ms. Dunya Miatovic and the Office of OSCE working for freedom of media. We have always been experiencing their support and their response to everything that happens in our country. And I would like to also thank for that uh, expert uh, potential that have been given to us that is linked to the need to reform uh, Belarus law in relation to media uh, with steps to um, approach our uh, legislation to the international norms. So that's probably, uh, those are the main things probably. Thank you very much. Litvina, and uh, I'd now like to turn to Jerzy Pomianowski. And, uh, Panie Dyrektorze, I'd like to ask you, um, first of all, what is the EU approach to this in general, what we've heard? And second, specifically, on the case of Belarus and what Jana just told us, you know, how can there be outside support in an authoritarian environment in which um, the government tries to actually actively disrupt such external support for independent media? 
Thank you. Thank you, Roland. It's uh, my great pleasure to be today in this uh, panel. Um, as it was already quoted, uh, we had our chance yesterday as European Endowment for Democracy to present our findings uh, on Russian language uh, media initiatives and uh, what we can do uh, to strengthen landscape and to make uh, more balanced uh, uh, approach uh, to the results, actually, of, of long and persisting uh, uh, and resilient in a sense of, of, of Russian uh, propaganda. So uh, today I would like to focus on other issues that are much closer uh, to the core activities of the European Endowment for Democracy, that is support to the local initiatives, also local media. Almost one third of our uh, projects uh, that uh, we are on daily basis supporting in the region in the Eastern Partnership countries are media-related uh, uh, projects, as European Endowment supports also political and social activists, uh, but among them, among those supported initiatives, uh, media-related initiatives are almost 30 percent. So it's very important because that shows, and these are not the big projects, these are medium-sized projects, they, th this, this shows uh, that uh, the work for democracy, for democratic values, requires support uh, for, um, uh, for, for media initiatives. And it was so strongly voiced today in the morning during opening uh, speech uh, by um, Veka Freiberga. There is no uh, uh, democracy uh, without free, fair and resilient uh, media. Uh, you're asking me, Roland, uh, what, what is the European position uh, on this? Uh, and I must say I'm in a difficult position to, to, to say uh, um, about it because the European Endowment for Democracy, although created by member states, is not a part of the institutional framework. We are an independent NGO, and we enjoy this independence. So being independent NGO, let me uh, be uh, a bit of uh, uh, uh, bringing here a critical voice of EU approach. First of all, um, I must say that although we all in every speech and every strategy say that media are important for democracy and for our cooperation with the Eastern Partnership countries, if we look into figures how much money we spend on it, it doesn't show that we really attach enough attention, that it's really a high budgeted uh, type of support. But it's not even the budget that makes, uh, uh, makes me feel that we are not doing well. It's the way we are doing. Uh, I'm saying we because uh, uh, my own country, Poland, is a member of the EU. We have and had chance to influence EU policies in this regard. We have our own uh, uh, small successes that was mentioned by Jana just uh, a moment ago about Radio, Radio Razia, about, about uh, TV Bielsat. So there are initiatives by uh, member states um, that can be mm, shown as a good example, but still, uh, if we look in the overall picture, it's, it's very fragmented and, uh, uh, and the lack of coordination, lack of uh, uh, a certain methodology is really, uh, is really missing. What I mean by that, uh, if, we, if we look, for example, uh, how many trainings for journalists are provided, how much money is spent uh, to send uh, some consultants or to invite journalists to, the, uh, to Europe, you will find it's quite a lot. Uh, is it uh, what they need most? What I hear from uh, media uh, people in the region, what I heard today uh, in the previous sessions, what I heard yesterday when I talk uh, uh, just uh, having side talks with the, with the people from different media outlets, they want uh, someone because the market situation for them is extremely unfavorable. And here we are talking both those who are working in an environment that is hostile, like in Belarus or in Azerbaijan, and those who are working in a permissive environment, like in Moldova or in Ukraine or even in Armenia, in Georgia, they have this difficulty simple financial difficulty to run the business. So what they need is really a core support, not a training, not another uh, set of very targeted projects. Uh, even if we talk about such important issues like media literacy, this is not what they are looking for. They are looking for feeling secure to do their core job. 
collecting and distributing informations, preparing materials, doing, serving their auditor, their audiences, uh, uh, serving their, uh, uh, their public. This is what they are uh, uh, looking for at most. And here, if we analyze donors' behavior, EU, but not only EU, we will see that this is a, a, a far priority or amount of money that is provided, amount of budget that is provided to support the core functioning of independent initiative is quite little. And if we then take an example, let's say Moldova and Ukraine, in my view, in these two countries, the biggest problem of media now is uh, need for the oligarchization. This is the core problem, as I feel, in those two countries. We have the moment of energy that has arose from that arose from uh, uh, from Maidan. That we have social activism. That we have plenty of interesting initiatives, but. With the time, they will be again dominated by three, four main media. And we are not talking now about Russian propaganda. We are talking about Ukrainian uh, media, although ownership structure is a bit bizarre. So if we look into ownership structure, we'll find the presence of Russian money there. But still, true oligarchs. And uh, these media are now, we can say, okay, difficult, but okay. But it will end when the political situation will settle, when the social energy will naturally uh, uh, go uh, lower, where attention from, uh, from the uh, public and uh, from our civil society will be less, those media will go back to serve their masters. And I was asking my friends in, in, in Ukraine and in Moldova, how come that in our societies, so many years after we, understand, we understood what freedom is for and how democracy can be advanced, uh, the people cannot understand that media, independence of media, means editorial independence. I was giving such a, a strange metaphor, uh, uh, bringing uh, a story about a hospital. In our countries, we already have a lot of private hospitals, in some countries more or less. And there are people making money of creating hospital. I would never imagine that we would naturally agree at being a doctor in this hospital and doing a surgery that the owner will tell me as a doctor how to do the, the surgery. I mean, it's impossible. The doctor knows what is his job and what is technique and how to deliver the right service. And this is the only way how the hospital is becoming a profitable business. Same with media. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the type of uh, logic that people here in this hall and on the European side through the legislation that was also discussed here when, we, when the Petro from Moldova was saying that we need to press those governments to really establish a legislation that will make a bigger distance between owner and editors. Because this is the only way how media can be more uh, independent. And we cannot avoid situation that they will be a big owners of the media, but let them be uh, less influential vis-a-vis -vis their editors and their journalists. So we need to have in the, in the, on the European side more work toward this direction. So the system of funding and donorship has to be improved. The volume of a budget should reflect the priority if we really attach attention uh, to the media that needs to be reflected also in budget. We need to finance the core of their activities and we also have to contain ourselves from the editorial influence. Because if we look into the programs that we finance through media uh, initiatives uh, supported by the donor funding, we would also find those indirect but rather strong influence that you need to talk about this type of inclusiveness or that type of inclusiveness, that you, you should promote uh, uh, a kind of European association agenda. There is a lot very good agenda they can do. We don't need to force them to attach to every funding a specific, uh, a specific agenda. What we need to care, it's a really uh, a good quality, uh, good quality journalist to be promoted. And the market situation, as I said at the beginning, is extremely weak. So from that point of view, those media 
to be resilient, they need long-term financing. And again, coming back to priority and to the Eastern Partnership, this conference is a first media conference, thanks to Latvian presidency, of the Eastern Partnership, which Riga summit, I mean, Eastern Partnership summit we are having in two days here, fought. And I must also blame myself because I was one of the organizers of the Eastern Partnership Summit in Warsaw in 2011, and we didn't organize a media conference. So that shows again that this attention was not paid enough strongly to the subject of uh, media development and the media role in helping uh, a transition of, of those countries into, into democracy and providing societies with a better access to the trustworthy and high quality journalism. So let me sum up. We have very diverse environments, so we have to have diverse tools. European Endowment for Democracy is designed to support media initiative, especially in the hostile environments, like in journalists working in Azerbaijan, journalists working in Belarus. In case of countries where we have more permissive environment, there are tools and methodologies that can be applied from bigger donors with the more sustainable systems, and they should really refocus and recalibrate uh, their support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yeje. And before we open up to the floor, uh, I'd just like to come back to Minister Melbarde for one brief comment. Uh, is the European Union, are its member states trying hard enough? Are, do, are we making enough efforts uh, to uh, support independent media in all the diverse uh, situations in the Eastern Partnership? Thank you for the question. The first thing that I would like to say is that every one of us have to understand that this increasing Russian propaganda in the EU environment is uh, a new phenomenon. And when we take into account that this happens in, for the first time in the digital world, so this is a new challenge for us uh, and for the European countries. I would not agree to the point that uh, the European Union uh, doesn't do anything or does insufficiently. And now, uh, when we're preparing for presidency and we are implementing the presidency program, uh, we can see how in this half a year has changed the attitude and the understanding of the member states uh, towards this question. Concerning uh, the presidency, I have to say that uh, now Latvia is the president in country uh, in the council, and I think that uh, I can say that propaganda question is one of our priorities that we have supported throughout our presidency, and this is the third international conference that is happening in our presidency time, and that highlights different questions connected to media. I also would like to say that uh, now the discussion has started and we are searching for solutions and the most important thing is that we are moving forward to the next stage where we could have identified uh, specific tools for support. From what was mentioned, I think that in the future, the most important for the EU framework, but this is my personal opinion, I think that uh, this is the thing that we will have to think about some kind of supporting tool or financial tool uh, in order to support analytical and high quality journalism. That would be the first, the most important thing about which we have to think. The second point that was mentioned uh, and that is being discussed right now and about which I would like to continue discussion is the support for democratical values and uh, for development of Russian-speaking media in Europe. I think that uh, this activity has two sides. From the one hand, uh, we have to understand that uh, the aim, uh, that the target of this uh, program is not only Russian-speaking people, uh, and we have to increase our content in Russian language, first of all in Latvia. And here, uh, this, is, this is question about uh, how we can ensure the competitiveness of small media uh, that are broadcasting in Russian language. And, 
and especially I would like to highlight uh, that we need to support small uh, ethnic medias. We now have uh, slightly below 20 minutes left. We're fully aware that we are between you and your lunch, so uh, we're not going to torture you for too long. But I believe there are some questions and comments from the floor. So let's take a first round. I see one hand right here. Let me see your other hands. Yes. Um, and then some people up there. We start with the gentleman here. Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, uh, Yuri Bibeshka. I represent the Ministry of Information of Belarus. I've been watching the discussion today, and I'd like to uh, offer you a different point of view. Uh, and I'd like delegates to hear it. Uh, the legislation of the Republic of Belarus is being developed considering the national um, features, including the laws on media. Uh, we shouldn't talk about uh, media monopolization because uh, we can see the statistical data and about 70% of media in Belarus are non-state-owned media. They are not owned by the state. Uh, considering the uh, diversity of opinions and uh, points of view, there is a complete information, a complete freedom to get information by for the citizens. If we look at the rating of the International Union of uh, Electronic Networks, uh, Belarus is ranked 38. Uh, this is in terms of development of telecommunication technologies and uh, information access. So more than 5 million people in Belarus um, use the Internet, considering the, that the uh, total number of population is about 10, above uh, 10 million. As to the law on uh, media, uh, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, we've heard uh, that the Ministry of Information can restrict access to Internet resources, but since uh, 1st January 2015, when the law entered into effect, only uh, the Ministry only uh, restricted access to 18 sites, and 15 of them were dealing drugs, one of them uh, was uh, were, uh, offering child pornography, and uh, two websites were closed because they used taboo um, words. So I think this is correspondent. This is in uh, um, accordance with European principles. The fourth row, right here in front of me, right here. Thank you. Um, I'm Vita Tarauda from the Baltic to Black Sea Alliance, uh, Latvia. <laughs> We're an NGO looking at common problems in the region from a security perspective and how to solve them. And we have prepared recommendations on the very issues being discussed today. And I'd like to highlight a few of the things discussed in the panel. Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, an incredibly welcome development that so much attention is now being paid to the weaponization of information from Russia and its effects in the region. We have a host of new research, uh, new proposals to discuss. What we don't see yet is the recognition or a sufficient recognition that these really are issues of security in the region and they should be treated as such when we think about the financial allocations we need to make to combating the weaponization of information. These are allocations at the national level and allocations at the European level. Um, on some of the issues raised in the panel today, uh, we'd like to emphasize that while uh, much focus, especially from the EED report, is placed on the Russian language broadcasting in the region, we should not be blind to the fact that the Russian narrative is permeating uh, the national media, national language media as well. And also, this is helped along by the fact that we have very weak 
media environments, especially in countries with small markets and small environments. And for this reason, we urge that the recommendations and the actions to be taken address both these issues, Russian language, broadcast strengthening from European values perspective, and also the small media, small market issues that would help the national broadcasters become resilient to this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now we have the lady all the way on the right and then the gentleman here in the third row. Thank you. I will be brief. Uh, I'm Victoria Brenza. I'm actually not media uh, person, but I'm a sociologist from Ukraine, and I'm very glad to be here among the media uh, experts and representatives because media is one of the key issues in transforming the society. Um, I want it just to add two uh, small things. In uh, Ukraine, for example, we have the situation when the whole educational system suffers from the approach where reproduction is imp more important than to building and defending own position. So it will be not the matter of introducing media literacy courses, but to rethinking educational system itself. And in Ukraine, we also have to deal with the horrible level of institutional trust. So it is very low, not only trust in media, but in institutions also. And introducing critical thinking may lead to cynical thinking, and which in its turn may lead, as we have heard yesterday, to predisposition to, um, of attractiveness of propaganda. Um, so I just wanted to add those things because I deal with teaching critical thinking for two years and I initiated uh, the course for students, journalists at one small university, so I see the first difficulties that we have in this matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now the gentleman in the third row and then Salome. Thank you. My name is Ashot Melikan. I am uh, chairman of the Committee of uh, Freedom of Speech in Armenia. Um, freedom of speech with national specifics, it's something very different, something new. Uh, and I would like to say that in Armenia we also uh, used to have a Ministry of Information we, and we, uh, we journalistic organizations always said that if we want uh, the freedom of speech and independence of media to develop in Armenia, first of all we have to cancel the Ministry of Information to eliminate it, which uh, was done in Armenia, and therefore the freedom of speech and the activity of uh, media um, had uh, its gains from it. And I would like to briefly continue the allegory uh, proposed by Mr. Paminovsky about medicine and the surgeon. Approximately the same thing happened recently in Armenia. Taxi drivers had a prop protest and the deputy minister of transportation addressed them and said, would you trust me, your wife, if I uh, wasn't a gynecologist? And also identifying this, uh, his incompetence, one of the taxi drivers told uh, him the same thing uh, in return, and he became famous. Uh, and they, they started to invite him to different TV channels. So uh, in every profession, every uh, profession has its value. We know that um, Russia spends crazy money for the propaganda that we all have enough of. But uh, the same money could be um, given for the quality journalism to truly fight this propaganda. I would like to find an answer or to hear an answer to this question. Thank you very much. And now it's Salome. And then next to you. Uh, we can't uh, hi, my name is Salome Samadashvili. I'm currently an independent consultant and uh, the executive director of the newly created Center for Strategic Communications and Democracy in Georgia, former Georgian ambassador to the EU. Uh, I want to bring an attention to something which we have not discussed uh, so far in this conference. And uh, in fact, um, I have um, just authored the publication for the Martin Center, Muzzling the Beer, the um, 
defense strategy for countering Russia's undeclared information war on Europe. And uh, it very much focuses on the way the Russian propaganda works, not necessarily in the Eastern Partnership countries, but in Western Europe. Uh, because, of course, this is something which is very important to focus for the future, because as we uh, observed the development of the public opinion uh, on Ukraine in the Western Europe, it was rather apparent that the Russian propaganda was very, very successful working in the countries of the Western Europe. And I think it's an interesting idea for the future discussions if the media conferences continue to be part of the Eastern Partnership format, how the media in the region can work with the Western media in order to counter the Russian propaganda, not only in Latvia or the countries where the Russian language media is a problem, but in the Western Europe, and particularly in Germany, I would emphasize where the Russian propaganda is uh, very successful. I'm sure Roland would agree with me. Thank you. I absolutely do. Now, we, sorry, we've got more volunteers for question than we can handle. I'm under strict instructions to end this fairly on time. Uh, I, I think we can, we can maybe go three minutes over time, but not more than that. The lady right here on the left in the second row, and then we take three more questions up there, and that's it. Sorry, guys. Thank you. My name is Alina Rado. I am an investigative reporter from Moldova. Uh, I have just uh, two proposals. Uh, we discuss about propaganda and in Moldova specifically propaganda is with the help of uh, oligarchs because re they own those channels that translate Russian channels in Moldova. Uh, we'll never find why they do, how much money they have from this, if we don't have any clarity on the media ownership in Moldova specifically, and we have to do something immediately. Uh, by the way, I see always very good news from Brussels that Moldova or Armenia or uh, Ukraine got next million or billion or a lot of money for different projects to improve democracy. Please, never give any money to this kind of government that are corrupted without giving a part of this money to media to monitor those money, what they do with those money. Because otherwise, those money from EU taxpayers goes to oligarchs. We don't have capacity to monitor everything, and then they become rich and more powerful, and we become less uh, powerful or more weak. Uh, so please, let's see how do we monitor any money that comes from Brussels. And second, I, in a kind, in a way, I appreciate the presence of Belarusian government here. And actually, I think any government of these countries, representatives should be here to listen to us, to see what do we think, and to make pressure to, on them directly. Thank you. Thank you for these very clear proposals. Um, now. Last three questions. Yes, the gentleman straight ahead, right here. Uh, my name is Ruslan Mikhailovsky. I, I am an editor of Russian-speaking uh, uh, newspaper from Moldova. I, think, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Yezhe Pominovsky uh, for um, speaking about economical conditions, uh, financial conditions of um, media. And as Petro, my colleague, mentioned, the concentration of media in the same hands, oligarch hands, or party hands, or political hands, um, create very difficult competitive conditions for independent media in fight for advertisement ma market. It's very difficult to fight such media, media holdings, especially for local um, media that try to promote quality journalism. We have this situation with advertisement in our country that I would call catastrophic. It's very difficult for us to survive. So my request or my proposal is I support your words that we have to change the principles of financing uh, the press or media outlets. So sometimes for us the last opportunity is financing from European foundations. But the 
important problem is that often money is given to non-government organizations, but independent private media uh, can't get this money. It's much more difficult for them than from N for NGOs. So my proposal is to also help private structures, private organizations that try to promote quality journalism. We try to build profitable business, but believe me, in our conditions, in, in the given situation, it's very difficult to survive. So I call you to help all those that are ready to promote quality journalism in our countries. Thank you. Um, next. So, uh, sorry, the organizers gave us actually some more time. We have till 12.30. No, 1.30, sorry. Till 1.30. Um, so, uh, I can take a few more questions. There was the, the gentleman all the way in the back, by the way. No, you have the microphone. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm from Ukraine, Internews Ukraine, Media NGO. My question is, or rather remark to Jerzy Pominowski about de-oligarchization. Um, I think one of the interesting uh, models of, of support of development is uh, freelancers, freelance journalism, which is in Ukraine or in Moldova, I think, well, it, at least in Ukraine, is a field which starts to be developing now. Uh, contrary to some Western European countries in which is quite uh, a typical, uh, typical field. I think uh, when we're thinking about this support, because okay, uh, many media like online media, even though that are those that are belonging to oligarchs or to big business, they are still quite open in opening, you know, their platforms for bloggers, for freelance journalists, etc. But freelance journalists need also funding for that, for their reports, for their traveling, for their fees, etc., etc. I think we, we have to think about it too, because our strength compared to Russians is, is in plurality. Not is in centralization of response, but in diversification of response. And if we think in terms of as many journalists who are independent, who can uh, find some money to make the reports and then publish them regardless of the media and of the ownership, it can be a good response. Thank you. Thank you. And we have the gentleman here in the third row, fourth row. Thank you. I'm Alex Grigoriev, uh, Baltic to Black Sea Alliance as well, Latvia. Uh, and I would like to support uh, some ideas that, that we have heard today. And that is uh, that uh, basically a regional challenge, and we have a regional challenge in the Russian information war on uh, the countries of the uh, Eastern Partnership and some of the countries of the uh, European Union as well. And it uh, should... Um, uh, have a regional answer, a regional response to that regional challenge. That is, uh, one, greater uh, cooperation between media institutions and media outlets within the Eastern Partnership countries, and uh, some recommendations can be made uh, right here in this, uh, within this framework of this conference. And second, uh, uh, a bigger uh, involvement of the European Union institutions uh, in that um, in that challenge and the response to the challenge, both institutionally and financially, because uh, because it is a, a threat and should be viewed as a national, not simply as a as a war of words, but a, a security threat. Thank you. Thanks very much. And right behind you, yeah, Mayor. Uh, Alexander Paulov, uh, Swap Business Magazine, I'm editor-in-chief and the founder of this magazine. I'm located in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, and um, by the way, something like 100 kilometers from the uh, zone of the fights. And, but um, uh, my question will coincide somehow the previous one and will concern the, the, this, this magic European funding. Um, in order to show uh, what Europe is and how the European institutions work, uh, every year I'm uh, organizing um, the special auto trips or auto races 
of regional U Ukrainian journalists around Europe. We, we, we previously we visited uh, European Commission in Brussels, uh, European Parliament in Strasbourg, and so on. We are involving in this project uh, the European experts uh, exactly in order to, to show the, the European activities, uh, European life to the regional Eastern Ukrainian audience. And by the way, um, this audience um, knows nothing, almost nothing about um, European life. And um, so, and always, ev every time I'm paying the uh, fees and expenses for these projects from my own pocket or from uh, some commercial sponsors. But the question is how to approach a bit, a bit uh, this uh, magic uh, European funding, not only for the capital, for Kiev's journalists, but for the regional ones as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. One last question. The gentleman right here, and then we ha have to do a final round of answers. Thank you. Uh, I am Mushfiq al from Azerbaijan. I am a chairman of the Journalist Trade Union of Azerbaijan. Uh, I have one short question and remarks. Cenab Nil'in çıxışından sonra bizim çoxlu yoldaşlar mənə yaxınlaşdılar. Burada əksəriyyətini mən tanıyıram, bizim həmkarlardılar və Azərbaycanda nə baş verdiyi ilə maraqlandılar. Yəni, Cenab Nil'in çıxışından elə hiss olunur ki, Azərbaycanda hər şey bitib və hər şey çox tragik formadadır. After the speech of Mr. Neil, some uh, my colleagues approached me about the situation in Azerbaijan and they think that the, uh, everything in Azerbaijan has been end and no chance. Açığı Cənab Nil'in çıxışı məni də çaşdırmışdı. Mən özüm də çaşdım. Yəni o mənim gəldiyim ölkə haqqında mı danışır yoxsa Çin, İran, hansısa bir Filipin haqqında danışır? I'm also surprised about the speech of Mr. Nils, and I'm disappointed about if he speaks, talks about Azerbaijan or China or I don't know Iran, etc. Ben bildirmek isterim ki düzdü. Bizde meyen problemler var, şunasların hepsi var, ama bizde her şey bitmiyor. Yani biz mevzuduk, faaliyet gösteri ve mübarza parlak söz azallığının berpası orunda. Sure, uh, I agree that we have um, some problems on human rights, but uh, it doesn't mean that everything uh, wars and uh, everything ends. And we, we, I want to repeat that we are allowed, we continue our struggle on defending human rights in Azerbaijan. Bizde Cenab Nil'in dostları tutulsa da, yani onlarla jurnalist teşkilatları, media kurumları mevcuttular ve onlar bugünkü konferansta iştirak edirlər. Also, some friends of Mr. Nils has been arrested in Azerbaijan, but the, another part of uh, human rights activists and journalists, as we are here and we continue our uh, struggle. Sualma Jalan, Biz Ichimin Dokuzunzi Yildan, Man Avropa Shakter of Tashlok Programman, Media Zrebutun Conference Larna Gartel Musham. I want to ask my uh, main question. Since two, uh, 2009, uh, our organization, uh, uh, me, I, I, I was uh, attending all conference of Eastern Partnership Program. Biz beş yıl bundan qabaq toplaşanda, üç yıl bundan qabaq toplaşanda çox niçbinidik və bütün şərq tərəfdaşlığına daxil olan ölkələrdə azad medianın durumu indikindən qat-qat yaxşı bir vəziyyətdə idi. Uh, back to three, five years ago, uh, the situation was more positive and uh, we were um, uh, more optimists than today. Ötən dövrdə nə baş verib? Niyə vəziyyət düzəlmək əvəzinə, yəni biz Avropaya yaxınlaşmaq əvəzinə vəziyyət daha pisə doğru dəyişib? Səbəb nədir? Bu proseslər ancaq şərq tərəfdaşına daxil olan ölkələr üzərində gedir, yoxsa qlobal bir prosesdir? And what is the reason of this uh, negative changing and we uh, get back? Uh, this is the for Eastern Partnership Program or another uh, reasons? 
Yəni, mən həmkərlərimin sadalamasından belə başa düşdüm ki, şərq tərəfdaşlığına daxil olan bütün ölkələrdə vəziyyət media sahəsində bərbatdır və vəziyyət getdiksə pisləşməyə doğru gedir. As I observe from the speech of my colleagues, the situation in the another countries uh, going to wars, uh, not only in Azerbaijan. Sizin mövqeyinizi bilmək istəyir. Excuse me, sir, could you please okay, come to the end of your question? And my question is uh, about the uh, opinion of what happens on the situation. Thank you very much. All right, now we go in reverse order. So I would like to ask Jerzy Pomianowski to take a couple of these answers. Well, you see, they, they, they mostly concern two areas. It's, it's the, the, the, the Russian threat, uh, weaponization of information, how to counter it. The other one is question of funding, pressure, but also general measures to help the independent media from the European Union. Uh, and then there were two gentlemen who um, were, uh, were uh, kind of offering a different, an alternative uh, vision of uh, uh, events and situations in their countries. Anyway, uh, Jerzy, you go first. Uh, my friend Ashot Melikian asked this question in Russian, so uh, I'm going to answer the question as well about uh, money and about funding. Uh, I don't think there will be much more money, but there might be a will to use them in a more intelligent way. So this is what we strive for, and therefore we also need your assistance. We need to think together how to do it better. Let's uh, switch uh, to English, uh, not because I don't like Russian language, I like this language very much, and that's why I spend so much time on, on analyzing uh, Russian language uh, media, because I strongly believe that uh, Russian language does not belong to Putin, it even does not belong to Russia, it belongs to those who likes this language and would like to communicate in it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great statement. Thank you. And, uh, but I didn't finish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But of course, I can finish if this is the moderator will. Go ahead. I'm One for democracy minute. and freedom of speech, but at the same time, I'm for a discipline. So. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, allowing me. Okay, so uh, regarding weaponization uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, media, of course, uh, in, the, in the yesterday's speech, uh, I think I made a very strong point about this, that, uh, that still many politicians, many governments uh, are not seeing uh, this problem as a real threat to security. When we have in Europe millions of people that believe that someone wants to kill them because the, the four main Putin media tells them that West is going to kill them, then of course this is a security threat because those people maybe one day will find an excuse uh, to come and kill us because they think we are their enemies and we are not. So this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is the huge problem. Fortunately, uh, the, the Russian, uh, uh, Russians and Russian-speaking people, they uh, maybe lost uh, uh, access to, to the trustworthy uh, media, but they didn't lose the sense of humor. So recently I read in, in Russian, I think it was in Twitter, but I'm not sure, uh, it passed just uh, quickly uh, through, through some of uh, information uh, that reached me, that uh, supposedly uh, the Russians are saying, well, we understand that Putin is soon going to destroy Europe and the West, but we need to know a few days before to bring our wives from the French Riviera and our kids from schools in London and Washington. So they have still this sense of humor. So there is a hope uh, this uh, weaponization of media can be reversed, but we have to do it smartly. And uh, as I'm strongly promoting, we should not think that uh, uh, fighting with weaponization of media means building counter-propaganda narrative. We have to find a smarter way, especially that, as it is already mentioned, the budgets that can be, uh, even if this main logic is accepted uh, overwhelmingly by all uh, at least European, member European Union member states, which is not the case yet, uh, it, it will not produce a significant uh, budget that can uh, be 
compared with the budget that is used uh, by uh, Russia. But one another optimistic remark from coming from our feasibility study is that the, in the internet, for example, the initiatives uh, that weaponizes, and this is also to answer uh, Minister uh, Melbarde, in the internet, the initi initiatives that are financed by Kremlin to weaponize information over internet, if we compare the budget and the effectiveness, it's rather low. So it is a very positive, uh, positive uh, uh, signal that it's not that easy, even with the big money, to uh, turn internet tools in favor of uh, such a classical propaganda. That is, that is, it, it is a finding. It is not just uh, what I think. So uh, here, with the much less money and with the, our main weapon, which is plurality and diversity, what was so well brought by the colleague from the Internews, we can do much, much more, both allowing uh, uh, and, and supporting those who are doing this from Western side, so-called, from the inside EU, and those who are doing this uh, in the countries uh, where uh, the, those processes are taking place. So here I think it is, it is uh, a very important element if we talk about uh, weaponization. And the one thing um, I wanted to say, the dilemma between a plurality, which we just talked about, it is diversification and central action. Uh, we strongly believe, and this also comes from the feasibility study, that this dilemma can be easily solved by supporting as many as possible existing initiatives in, a, in a smaller and bigger, but at the same time supporting mechanisms that was already also brought here for better coordination and eventually some kind of or, or joint regional or pan-regional branding. So that will consolidate them, that will help them, that will also allow them to speak and to address their issue jointly, but at the same time they will remain diverse, independent and plural. So this dilemma I think is solvable. It does need to uh, be made a single choice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerzy. Uh, now everyone uh, else has about 10 seconds left per person. Oh. <laughs> Let's try this. Jana, you have to you have to answer to your fellow Belarusian. Uh, Thank you. A couple of words about national features of Belarus. I'm going to uh, decipher what I was uh, meaning. Uh, Eastern partnership and uh, engagement, participation of Belarus um, is not to its full uh, force, and Euronest works uh, in Eastern partnership without an official delegation from our parliament. So, so yesterday, when we heard about ambitious projects, about uh, new centers, content factories, um, I uh, am concerned, considering the natural features, uh, that uh, the uh, distribution channels are closed, the distribution channels of all these wonderful projects. Another thing for me, uh, which is very important for me, Belarus is talking a lot about its willingness and its desire to uh, expand partnership, uh, and we are talking about the necessity to restore the status of a uh, specially invited country in the, Soviet, uh, in the Council of Europe. And uh, during each dialogue and each meeting with the official Minsk, you should include in the agenda all the issues related to the freedom of speech, the issues related to imperfections of uh, Belarusian legislation on uh, media. And uh, if we will be able to achieve any progress, then uh, everything will develop much faster. Thank you. No question about, no question about uh, trollers from Moldovan government? No? Yep. Uh, Jeanne, in the first part of her presentation, mentioned something I think should be emphasized again. It is important that media community and professional journalists analyze each case of propaganda, of information manipulation. In my opinion, stop fakes are required not only in Ukraine, they are also required in all our countries. And it is necessary to reveal such cases because there are plenty of them in our national media. And we need to find these cases out. We need to uh, 
push uh, the people out, uh, the people who uh, claim to be journalists, although they are not journalists, they deal with propaganda, etc., so that uh, we uh, preserve the prestige of our profession. Uh, well, before I turn uh, the, the, the, to, to, the, to our Latvian hosts for the final remarks, uh, uh, Minister Melbarde and, and, and, and Minister Stipreis, I'd like, just like to, to, to give you one hint on what the Martin Center is doing in terms of providing an answer to Russian propaganda, mixing it with entertainment. We have a format now called the, the, the Week in 60 Seconds, and it literally is a 60-second commentary on what happened in the past week, usually two or three topics. For some strange reason, Russia and Mr. Putin have been figuring in almost every edition of the Week in 60 Seconds for the last two months. And uh, you can get it on YouTube if you just put in Martin's Center, in one word, spelled the British way, Martin's, and you get to the week in 60 seconds and you can watch all the 20 or so editions that we've had so far in this year. All right, now, final words to Minister Melbarde and then, and then Minister Stipreis. Mm -hmm. uh, paldies. Es uh, me Thank you. I would like to conclude shortly from my side. So we heard questions that it is necessary to invest funds in order to support media. And I would like to say that there are actually many problems that we can solve with uh, a little amount of money. So for example, a question about a media concentration that we can solve with legislation. And also we need few resources in order to develop uh, media policy in our country and national policy. We also have self-regulation mechanisms that uh, actually is a question pertinent to media and journalists themselves. And uh, well maybe we can actually establish a ombudsman body that could uh, survey media quality questions and thus we can solve this problem. And also uh, if we construct a platform for uh, a stop light platform, it also uh, does not uh, request any funds. So these are the things that we can do quite fast. Uh, speaking about questions that need bigger funding and where we have to think about uh, development of certain financial tools and that really uh, need to be supported, I think that this is uh, support for high quality journalism. So we need to understand that high quality journalism needs money and it costs money. And unfortunately in a country with such a small culture and ethical uh, area, we need to pay more for this high quality journalism. And uh, I think that we have to make this domain a priority. And also uh, I think that uh, we we need to support printed press. Yes, um, Ron, if I may, um, um, as, um, as the chair of, of, of this conference, I would like to, to, to answer to the question which was posed by our Azerbaijani friend, and this is on, on the intervention uh, by the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, Nils Muzhnex. I mean, first of all, the Council of Europe and the European Union and the Eastern Partnership of the European Union are two separate things. So, but at the same time, as most of the countries involved in the Eastern Partnership are members of the Council of Europe, of course, the opinion of uh, the well, Commissioner is very important to, to everybody and it's his privilege and right to highlight those issues which are probably uh, of the most concern to him currently. So, but at the same time, I, I would like to say uh, that, I mean, we are not within the Eastern Partnership trying to single out any country for its internal problems. I think we would like to deal with those problems that exist uh, across the board and, and try to, to deal with them in a uh, systemic way. So uh, this is on, on, on this. Then probably on the, there were many questions on probable 
uh, support to, to, to, to the uh, quality media. And in this respect, I would, I, I would invite you, please come timely after the lunch break for the next session, which would be exactly on this issue. <laughs> so um, with this, and I would like to usurp my, my, um, uh, my rights of, of, of the chair, I uh, would like to, to declare uh, this session now closed. Please give a round of applause to the panelists and, of course, to our moderator, who did an excellent job. So, two announcements of the, of the housekeeping. One is that we are coming back exactly on time indicated in our program, so it's quarter to three. And the second, may I ask Arif Aliyev and Maya uh, Mikoshevice, please come forward here to the chair. Uh, uh, we need to talk to you about the next uh, panel. Okay, thanks.